So first up, we are very lucky to hear from uh, Paul Fitzmaurice. Um, Paul is a lead consultant with Elaborate. Um, he is a very experienced uh, product person who has worked uh, in both the UK and Australia, um, working for uh, large brands like uh, Standard Life um, and Prudential. Prudential, as everyone was thinking of, um, and is currently uh, leading uh, cross-functional agile teams and. Uh, helping them to ship great customer experiences uh, around Brisbane. So if you give a uh, product tank, welcome to Paul Fitzmaurice. I'm going to do that, and I'll get your slides up. Um, thanks for that. So yeah, we have been talking, and we do need to talk at least for 15 minutes-ish, because James has promised a rather spectacular dance at the 15 minute point. <laughs> so expect to see that. Um, actually, can you guys hear me if I talk without the microphone? Is that fine? Or do you want the microphone as well? Try the mic? Okay. So I'll have one in each hand. Um, so I'm going to talk about product management and the, the art, of, art of juggling. Um, so basically, I want to just start with a little bit of context. A lot of what we do is about context. So. This is the context in which we all operate in. So, you know, there's rapid change. We've got, you know, faster moving competitors, demanding customers, and a constant sort of drive for efficiency. That's, that's pretty, you know, pretty much the environment with which we're all operating in. So what does it mean for us as, as product managers? Well, basically, we're getting asked to do what can be the impossible at times. We've got to do more. We've got to do it faster. Do more with less. Do it faster. But get it right. Not just get it right the first time, but get it right on an ongoing basis. So it can feel a bit like this. You know, juggling balls on a, on a unicycle on a tightrope. Um, so what I thought, uh, as James mentioned, I've, I've worked in Australia and I was over in the UK for the last 12 years. Um, and since I've been back in Australia since January, I've probably worked for about, worked directly with about 30 different product owners in Brisbane. So what I thought I might do is just start to share some of the, the key themes that are coming out. Um, and the, the, the typical ones that you, you probably imagine around, you know, well, we need to sort our delivery capability. And for teams that have delivery capability, it tends to be, well, we're not really customer centric. We're just building stuff. We're building features for the sake of it. And maybe, maybe they are customer centric, but we're not really realizing any tangible business value. So these are some of the common challenges. And the final one's really around, around roadmaps. We've already touched a little bit on roadmaps tonight, but teams typically taking their backlog, turning it on its side, and adding dates to it. Um, and of course, the challenge with that, if you do that, it turns into basically a bit of a, a, bit of a project plan. One of the challenges with project plans is, well, there's some pretty key assumptions. It assumes you know how long it takes to build things. It assumes nothing changes. It assumes you get everything right the first time. So back to the context, back to the challenges, there's some big assumptions in there with, with roadmaps. So what can you do about those challenges? I thought given it's product tank, it, it is appropriate to introduce Martin's sort of Venn diagram. Martin's the, the founder of, of product tank. Um, he talks about it in the context of UX technology and business and then a product management sits in the middle. So I'm sure a lot of you are fairly familiar with, with that. I'm going to take a slightly different slant on it. And Martin says, look, a good project product manager must be experienced in one and passionate about all three. So how I'm going to talk about it is slightly different. It's what are the three key disciplines you need to be able to juggle as a, as a product manager? The first one that really powers the other two is, is agile and agile delivery. So this is all about delivering early and delivering often but doing it in a predictable and probably more importantly a sustainable way. So we don't want heroic efforts here. I have worked for an organisation where an executive literally came into a project team's office space and started throwing sleeping bags on the ground because he didn't want them to leave before it was finished. You know, that's not really a nice working environment. We don't want those heroic efforts. Second one is around design thinking. Now this is about solving real customer problems, not working on vanity projects. 
So who here has worked on a vanity project? Talking about not something that doesn't have a real sort of business problem, might be the last last best idea someone has, the last shiny. Normally it's a pet project from one of the executives. So solving real customer problems. And the next one is Lean Startup. And we know a lot of this to Eric Reese and, and, and his book. Um, but it's about solving key business problems in the most <coughs> in the most efficient way. And I'll say just as a product manager, if you can successfully combine these three disciplines in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, your product management capability will be a really powerful competitive advantage for your organization. So let's focus a little bit on delivery. So delivery brings credibility and belief. So credibility with stakeholders, credibility that you can actually deliver something, but also credibility from a the, the actual facts, the information delivery gives you, it gives you real information to allow you to make fact-based decisions. And when you can make fact-based decisions, suddenly the hippo effect doesn't come into play. So does anyone know what I'm talking about when I talk about the hippo effect? That's the highest paid person's opinion. And it's how do you overcome the hippo? We actually used to call it out a lot in our meetings in our organisation. So it brings credibility, but it also brings belief. Belief for the team, belief in themselves, belief in themselves as a team, as a collective. So a really important thing. So how does a product manager support delivery? Well, there's a couple of key ways. First of all, it's understanding. So understanding, helping the team understand what problem they're solving and why. So what I'm talking about here is not just focusing on the outputs of what you're going to deliver, but the outcomes you want to achieve as a result of those changes. So as a result of those deliveries, what outcomes do you want to achieve? The second is alignment. Are the team aligned? Do they, have, are, as a collective group, or are they working as individuals? So I, when I was in the UK, I used to, to sort of manage a team of between five and six different product owners. They all worked with agile teams of between about seven to 10 in number. And typically, it would be the high flyers that would be coming into this space, really sort of high-performing individuals. The first thing I'd say to them is, I'm not measuring you on your individual, I'm not measuring you on, as an individual now, I'm measuring you as a collective, as part of the team, as a, your ability to make the team more effective at what they do, and your ability to work as part of a team. So it's not about you as an individual, so it's a real mindset change for people. And the final one is empowerment. So are the teams empowered to develop the right solutions? Or as a product manager, are you just sit there, sitting there trying to dictate, dictate to them, this is what you must build? So a product manager articulates what problem to solve and why, and supports the team, supports the team determine the how. Because the empowerment space is all around motivation. And I'm sure a few of you have read Dan Pink's book called Drive, talking of really focusing on intrinsic motivators rather than ex the external sort of motivators, the carrot and stick. Intrinsic motivators are much more powerful. And they're things like, you know, autonomy, the desire to try and be, you know, self-directed, mastery, the desire to, to get really skillful at a particular task or activity, and purpose. So having a clear sort of purpose at something that's meaningful. These motivators are much more important than the, than the traditional carrot and stick. So design thinking, understanding the problem and creating the, the right solution. The biggest challenge I see in teams with design thinking is being able to apply it on an ongoing basis. Typically, you come to a point where there's a dynamic and a challenge between, look, let us just write some code versus, no, no, we need to do this design thinking activity. Typically, when I see teams, design thinking is something that happens at the start of a big project, before the team's fully mobilized, so they can't actually be working anyway. What needs to happen is it needs to become part of your everyday. So, each experience we create should. Thinking about design thinking, serve a clear purpose, clear and definitive purpose. Manage, meet, and exceed customer expectations. So a couple of years ago, I worked on a digital journey that was essentially replacing a phone call. It was replacing a phone conversation. Now the challenge with this is the phone conversation 
typically lasted 45 minutes. It was financial services, so it was heavily regulated. There were 18 mandatory questions that had to be asked, and you had to complete a financial capability assessment. So that's what we are actually replacing. So if you think about that in the context of meeting, managing, exceeding customer expectations when you need that much information to go through, really challenging thing. Of course, you want to minimize the effort and save time so the customers can get into a state of flow. And then, importantly, <coughs> reward the customer for their time by demonstrating value. This is something that games do very well. This is where gamification comes in. A lot of the journeys I, I see could really, really get enhanced by actually thinking about, well, we've asked for this information from the customer. How are we demonstrating value to them immediately for them giving us this information? So my tip to you is how do you make design thinking part of your everyday way of working rather than it's off the side of your desk activity? Now, the lean startup and really focusing on business, business problems. Build to learn rather than build to build. So again, a slightly different view of the world. It's, it's assuming, and let's, let's be real, we don't actually know what the perfect solution is. As much as product managers we might be out there saying that we do know what the perfect solution is, even if you do, today it will be different in a week's time. We work in a dynamic environment. So embrace that uncertainty, but embrace it with discipline. Embrace it in the context of you treating everything you do as an experiment. So you're thinking about, do customers really value this feature? Are they willing to pay for it? How would they react if you took it away? Would they really care? So if you're trying to understand your product market fit, so how closely does your product meet the needs of the customer, that third point's a great place to start. Shape a question around how much they would care if you took the product or feature away. And we've talked a bit about highest risk assumptions, testing your riskiest assumptions. That's what the Lean Startup's all about. It's understanding your key assumptions, creating a hypothesis around that, and then putting it into the build, measure, learn, feedback loop. You can see how it goes hand in hand with Agile delivery. And in the context of the environment which we're all operating, Success goes to those who learn the fastest and react the quickest. Worth thinking about, even if you don't have the right solution now, if you've got the right capability, you can get there faster than your competitors. So I wanted to move, talk a little bit about moving from a position of doubt to a position of certainty. So everything we're trying to do is basically do that. Move you from a position of doubt to a position of certainty. Most teams I work with, Start off in the exploring issue space, they'll do some interviews, potentially some focus groups, understand that. Then they might quantify those issues or jump straight to a prototype to validate their solution, which is great. Very few of the teams actually take it all the way further and go and start thinking about optimizing their solution. So I'm talking about A-B testing, putting up two different variants and seeing which one wins. Multi-variant testing, testing multiple elements of the pages. So if you think about the top right hand corner, what you're doing there, you're applying design thinking, you're using your agile delivery capability, and you're also losing your, you're losing your, your lean startup approach as well. Really powerful stuff if you can get to the top right hand corner. Now that's not the only place with which you need to operate. You need to operate across all the different quadrants, but I'd say think about how you can get there. Because if you think about fact based decisions and removing doubt, if you can operate in that space, very powerful. So how does a product manager know where to focus? Well, it depends. You know, which disciplines are you applying? What's your challenge? Do you actually understand your problem? Do you know who your customers are? You'd be amazed how many different teams I work with don't actually know who their customers are. All this, their customers, is a group of 25 different sort of customer segments. And they're all the key target customer. Um, your team, what's the maturity of your team like? Is it all around just getting your delivery momentum up? Because that's the, that's the great place to start because that really powers your design thinking and your lean startup approach. Your customers, are they internal, external? Do you really understand their pain points? And what are the business drivers? So is it a long-term play or is it about short-term reward if it's in the startup space? Short-term validation of an idea. So there's some generic principles I was going to share, <coughs> and this is adopted from, from Jeff Gothelf, 
who did a great speech down at Agile Australia this year. And he talked about some of the, some of the principles that apply across the different disciplines. So customer value equals business value. The number one driver for business value is typically customer retention rates, long-term business value. So if you think about that in the context of if you can achieve long-term strong customer retention rates, you're achieving business value. Work in short cycles, because what that gives you is fast feedback loops. It means you're more efficient because you get better at what you do. Go and see. So this is understanding the customer context. Very important. Test your riskiest assumptions first. So what are the riskiest assumptions? And which ones do you know the least about? They're the ones you want to test first. You're not going to test all your assumptions. A lot of what you do as a product manager is about judgment. But test your riskiest assumptions first. Ensure you've got the right capabilities. So this means, can you take something right through to delivery? And opt ongoing optimization. Radical transparency across the team. So you're trying to create a position of um, psychological safety, where the team feels safe in the environment in which they operate in. Understanding the team motivation. So we've talked a little bit about intrinsic motivations rather than extrinsic motivations. And make design thinking part of the backlog. So for the final slide, I just thought I'd, I'd leave you with what drives sustainable competitive advantage? So I've been working in product probably nearly 20 years. And I'd say I started in a more traditional product management and, and have moved now into more agile product management. And it used to be all about the product and our features. Who had the best product? Who had the best features? And then the shift and the move has been very much to, OK, it's not about features. It's about the customer benefits and the customer experience. So let's focus on the end-to-end -end customer experience. And the product's only a piece of the puzzle. So the question really is, well, what's the next thing? What drives competitive advantage? Well, for me, it builds on those two things. And it's the capability. So do you have the capability? to be able to constantly evolve your solution and your experiences in an ongoing capacity. That's where you're going to get your sustainable competitive advantage, which is a very different mindset, thinking about our competitive advantage is this great new product we've got. No, it's our ongoing capability. Cheers, thanks for that.